Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today, I'm speaking with Alan Davison. Alan is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Technology in Sydney. Hi, Alan. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Abed. Great to be on the show. I've been a long-time listener, and I'm thrilled to be on. Oh, thank you. Um, well, thanks for listening. Uh, one, of the, one of the few, I guess. Um, I, so you'd sent me a paper about how multiculturalism and Islamophobia and how, you know, the new anti-racism, how that's all coming together. Um, so if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind going a bit into your paper and we just start from there. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Look, um, there, I think there's several intersecting bits and pieces going on now because uh, obviously multiculturalism is a, is a, a long running and very rich discussion about that from a variety of perspectives, policy perspectives, theoretical perspectives, et cetera. Australia is seen to be, by and large, a very successful multicultural country for a variety of reasons. We have um, you know, strong immigration, well, generally welcome people in. And of course, there's threads of racism, both dating back uh, through the you know, initial colonization of the country itself, of course. But also, of course, there's uh, racism between groups because you know we've embraced people from around the world to come here and we shouldn't assume that they necessarily get on as well. So multiculturalism is quite a rich uh, topic of conversation here in Australia. It has been for some years. Then we've got um, anti-racism, which is, if you like, uh, a more recent manifestation. And I, and I certainly wouldn't want to conflate anti-racism with, say, a commitment to multiculturalism. Different things, even though there might be overlap in some of the, in some of the discourse. And on top of anti-racism, of course, we've got what is, if you like, the poster child of anti-racism in many ways here in Australia, probably here at other place, places in the world, and that's Islamophobia. Uh, even though, of course, it, it's arguable that even if there was such a thing as Islamophobia, it's not racist. <laughs> it hasn't been actually anything to do with race per se, but it's all conflated together. So the article I sent you and the one that I published in uh, the journal Society this year is really looking at the how those various bits and pieces are intersecting, but specifically doing looking at and critiquing what's called anti-racism research into Islamophobia in Australia. So it's those sort of bits and pieces. And obviously it's a massively complex topic, but I'm really just picking out a thread around a particular type of research that is self-identified, that is by the researchers and the research institutes involved in it as anti-racist. That's how they identify themselves and who am I to challenge their identity. Uh, and they're basically looking at what they're claiming to be the rise of Islamophobia in Australia over the, say, let's say the last 20 years in particular, for obvious reasons, post 9-11, if you like. I was gone from 2002 into, until 2014. So, you know, I left a little, like around a year after 9-11. So I saw some of the, the backlash after 9-11 and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that had happened. And when I came back, that was one of the first things I noticed was any criticism of Islam came with, you were called a racist, you were called a bigot. There weren't a lot of very vocal ex-Muslims around 2014 or even reform Muslims, but you know, I saw people like Majid Nawaz getting called um, house Muslims and you know, Uncle Tom's native informants and so, like all kinds of stuff. And it just, it was ridiculous. When I look at it in North America, like I, if we're talking anti-racism, like Kendi's version of anti-racism hadn't come out yet. I mean, there was that it was already in the air. I mean, you had intersectionality come out in the nineties and you had CRT come out, you know, well, you can go back to the legal scholarship in the seventies, but you know, CRT really around mid eighties and stuff like that. So around that time, it was more, it was more relativistic and there was still some of the post-colonial stuff in it, but I'm just wondering like in Australia, are they, are they adapting like a Kendi style anti-racism for Australia and they're focusing on Islamophobia with it? Cause like I said, when I was, when I first saw it out here, I mean, it was called racist, but there was no talk of anti-racism in respect to Islamophobia. Um, so I'm just curious, like in Australia, if they were like adapting anti-racism to have a more like Australian feel to it. Well, possibly look, there's some, Again, multiple threads, and I'm very loath to generalise mm -hmm. about, say, academics that are doing work mm -hmm. into multiculturalism, racism, mm -hmm. etc. There's a lot of, I think, excellent work being done, a lot of good data being uh, gathered as well. I think where the complexity is, um, leaving aside the 
you know, the cognitive dissonance of racism and Islamophobia, just leaving that aside for the moment. It's all seen through this lens. Definitely critical race theory, if we can broadly conceptualise that here, that's being applied. And I think now some researchers are perhaps retrospectively identifying themselves as actively anti-racist and anti-racism researchers, even though they might not have used the term, say, 20 years ago, but they've now, if you like, grown into or can easily be identified with that, with that stream of that approach. Um, so this, this kind of research has been going on for a while, and it's very much focused on, if you like, finding the hidden or not so hidden power relations between, you know, the colonizer and the colonized, the powerful and the powerless, etc. So if we just have that as a baseline of where this research is coming from, um, it's seeing that as a singular lens by which to view so-called Islamophobia, if you like. So I, I'm, that's why in the paper I call it a Ptolemaic approach, you know, uh, power relationships are in the centre of the universe, like, you know, like the, the earth was in the centre of the universe. <laughs> and so power relations, race relations, colonise, all those things are, all roads lead to Rome in that respect. So when they're interpreting the data they gather, and there's a whole issue around the kind of data they gather through, the, say, these uh, surveys, which is mainly where they gather the data, everything is then fed through that lens. And that is the singular explanation for, say, all discrepancies or, or things that emerge through the data gathering, the survey work they do in particular, using these attitudinal questions. Everything is interpreted through that lens to the detriment of even asking you know, a few obvious questions. Is there another explanation for why someone might say, uh, I'm concerned about a mosque being built in my neighbourhood? It could well be that anti-Muslim sentiment is a key driver there. And I've noticed I'm calling it anti-Muslim sentiment, which certainly exists, absolutely yeah. exists. Uh, or uh, might there be an, another series of concerns, indeed concerns often expressed by the Muslim community themselves, that there'll be someone parachuted in who's a Helen Brimstone type preacher who doesn't re represent their community at all. Again, you know, discussed within Muslim community themselves. Is it being funded by uh, Qatari money? No, there is a whole lot of very reasonable questions to ask before you should be labelled an Islamophobic. And there may well be people that fit that category at the end of the day. But what interests me is there's a lack of concern into alternative explanations or nuance with this kind of attitudinal question. And that's a classic one, you know, how would you feel if a mosque mm. was built? And the other one, of course, is how would you feel if a close relative was to marry a person of X background and when they, when they run the test through of a Muslim background, they find there's high levels of concern amongst the non-Muslim respondents. Now, of course, through this anti-racist lens, that is interpreted as evidence of Islamophobia, rather than the obvious question, are there other possible reasons why a non-Muslim person might be concerned about a close family member marrying into a Muslim community? That doesn't get discussed. Instead, it's singularly interpreted through the lens of, if you like, critical race theory and its, and its um, conjunct sets of uh, theories about power relations, etc. I don't know much about what was going on in Australia. I mean, I've spoken to a, a few ex-Muslims from Australia, and I remember there'd been a small documentary that had come out about ex-Muslims in Australia um, a little while back. In North America, it was, you know, there was... You were called Islamophobic. You were called racist. Like the mention of the power dynamic didn't come up through here so much. It was just that it was just racist and you're going to bring harm onto Muslims. And it was even like the pulse attack, <clears throat> the, the, the nightclub attack. They play it up as like, okay, well, we don't have to, oh, please don't, you know, take this out on Muslims. Please don't, you know, like what's going to be the backlash to the Muslim community? I mean, it was just implied that whatever, either Canada or the United States are explicitly racist and, you know, that's, this is just going to let the racism out. It's so, I mean, it was slightly different here. Like were, was the talk of Islamophobia um, pretty much right from the get go after nine 11, or was there any time where it, there was like a little bit freer discussion allowed to happen? No, that's an excellent question. And look, it depends very hard to generalise because if you're talking about debate in the public, for instance, then you can look at, say, media outlets. And we've got some, you know, progressive, if you like, liberal, as we call here, media outlets. We've also got some more conservative and even right-wing media outlets here. So often, if you like, public debate was 
shaped to some degree or fanned um, definitely by some right-wing media who, of course, uh, you know, they love the clicks mm-hmm. and they were happy to fan uh, anti-Muslim sentiment. But, of course, within that debate were legitimate issues being raised regarding, for instance, the link between religious belief and terrorist acts, which is another forbidden topic, of course. And a couple of, mm-hmm. a couple of interesting sociologists have talked about that. Um, and what we have is this, this bizarre um, contradiction where when there's a right-wing attack, so that terrible massacre in Christchurch not that long ago, um, that is somehow linked to the idea of uh, white supremacy, which is itself being seen as systemic within white society. So in other words, when there's a, a, white, a right-wing uh, neo-Nazi attack against a minority group, that's seen somehow to be the crystallisation of white racism, white supremacy, and everyone's, you know, everyone's very happy to make that. Now, the problem is, of course, when there's an attack by a Muslim extremist on non-Muslims, or indeed other Muslims, which is often the case, that's always, we're always told that's an aberration. You know, the beliefs of those people, they're just whatever, they're extreme or whatever, they don't, they don't in no way reflect the beliefs related to Islam. So in other words, when there's a right-wing attack by a white supremacist, that's somehow indicative of systemic white supremacy in colonial society, for instance, or post-colonial society. But when there's an attack by an Islamist, that seemed to be an aberration. Now, you don't need to have done much beyond Logic 101 to know there's a problem there. How can one be indicative of a systemic issue, you know, a crystallisation of racism of people, which is generally kept under control, but it manifests through this crazy person with a gun killing Muslims. And somehow everyone that's white is responsible for that and white beliefs, Eurocentric culture, all the rest of it. And yet when the countless many more attacks by Islamists on people is seen and characterised as, oh, that's an aberration of Islam. Now, those two things don't make sense when you put them together. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and we find this manifest in a lot of research, a lot of research coming out of academia where right-wing attacks are seen as evidence of boiling up white supremacy that's always there latent. And when there's an Islamist attack, we're told, oh, well, that's an aberration. That's not true Islam. Now, I don't see how both those things can be true using the same levels of logic without a lot more discussion about how that actually works. My stab at that, like I'll, I'll try to take... So because white people have been in power since the enlightenment, so like starting off with colonialism, so, you know, whatever. So the Western civilization rose, enlightenment civilization rose. I mean, you had all that going, but that was, that's now a white construct. And that is, that construct is held in place to keep white people supreme and in power. So that's also what they mean by white supremacy is everywhere. So, that guy in Christchurch or the guy in um, uh, it was in Pittsburgh at the tree of life synagogue, you know, that's a manifestation of white supremacy because the system in and of itself is there to uphold white people because it was created by white people. It is a white way of knowing that's been imposed on everyone else. So whereas Muslims are marginalized, you know, victims of colonialization, this and that, even though, you know, there was some of the largest empires in the world were Muslim, but anyway, let's, let's yes, not and, forget. And that. colonized by Muslims, of course. Yeah, let's not, exactly. Let's not talk about that. Yeah. So that's where the white supremacy thing comes in because white people are in power. It is a white supremacy system to begin with. So when that happens, all white people are you know that that's that's original sin mm. like you know you are guilty of your whiteness and so that's why i mean uh, i can't remember what university it was just recently in the us uh whites and asians they're categorizing people by race to see demographics of the university it's whites and asians and of course jews but they've yeah, been well, whites, Jewish they've people, been whites for a long time. Yeah, they, yeah so. I mean, yeah, this stuff is inherently anti-Semitic. Um, you know, Jews have taken on whiteness, and it, like, I mean, I see stuff now like Jews of color. Um, you know, so yeah, so that that's where that white supremacy thing comes in. Yeah. So well, I because, think you characterized it really well. 
Um, but of course, it's not a logical argument. The fact oh, there, of, there's of an obvious not. truism. There's an obvious truism that when let's call it civilizations arise and they're attached to a particular series of modes of thought, belief, structures, systems, mm. of course, people within those systems, consciously or unconsciously, in short term or long term, try to replicate and build upon that system. That's true. Countless times, you know civilizations, mm. systems of knowing, etc., they tend to reinforce themselves. But what I'd say is one of the saving graces of, let's call it the Enlightenment, is the, the Enlightenment has been openly self-critical of itself and brings critique to systems of belief, including its own, for ages. So while it's true that uh, many of these guys, and mainly guys, of course, have been white, that doesn't necessarily mean that the fact that they were, let's say, cis white males, uh, their physical and psychological characteristics must necessarily embed every element of the thought process and the understandings and the approach to science and rigorous testing, etc. Uh, it's such it's such a cheap argument to say that oh well, there was a white a white guy who came up with this theory of relativity. Okay, he was he might have been Jewish, but let's call him white now. Uh, so, therefore, the theory of relativity uh, is the encapsulation of white supremacy. Now, if that's the level of your argument, that's like, you know, a 10-year-old. Yeah. Well, there was actually a paper in the 90s about how the theory of relativity was sexist, and misogynistic. Yeah. And what I'd say to those people now is, <laughs> you know, stop using your GPS when you're navigating because without Einstein's theory of relativity, GPS navigation wouldn't work. And the fact that you're yeah. using GPS navigation when you're navigating your way to the critical race theory conference to then talk about Einstein being a white supremacist, you're actually partaking in white supremacy because it's only due to Einstein's theory of relativity that we're able to understand the time differential between how our guidance devices on the planet mm -hmm. speak to the satellites traveling around in, in space. So if, if if you believe that Einstein is the epitome of white supremacy in his theories, you need to stop using a GPS. Go back to using a map. I mean, you can get into nitpicking things like that too. I mean, and I know what you're saying. It's but okay. The the thing that came out, you know, what's really going on in the schools here now? It's just, I mean, it's awful. Um, like maths is racist. It's a white way of knowing. And you point out that, well, no, we're using Arabic numerals. You mm. know, that came from India. And then the response then is, okay, well, it's cultural appropriation then. There's something deeply naive about the idea of identifying a thought system, a way, way of knowing in an absolutely reductive way to the people that produce that way of knowing as if that it is, it is indivisible from it. You know, um, a person of any background might come up with a good idea that helps explain the world around us. We then go and test and retest and, and attack and critique that way of knowing. The idea that you can attack and critique that way of knowing because of the characteristics of the person that fought it up is the height of, a, of reductive absurdity. You know, I mean, what, you know, what happens with, you know, someone that says, oh, I believe in alternative medicine or um, I, I, I don't follow Western medicine because it's white supremacist medicine. And what I'm going to do is follow an alternative way of knowing maybe a, a, an approach to health and well-being and medicine that comes from the Indigenous community of the country that I'm in, say. That's fine. But, um, but uh, when your kid's appendix is about to burst, what are you going to do? Are you going to take them to ER or are you going to go and get the local shaman to come in? You know, it's all bullshit. So people pose this stuff, but I can guarantee that nearly every every um, scholar that gets up at one of these conferences and spouts off this stuff, I bet they've been to ER. I bet they've benefited from modern medicine all the time. And yet they'll get up in front of a crowd of people and say, modern medicine is simply one way of knowing. And the now, it doesn't mean to say there's not a slither of truth to that. There's all kinds of problems mm -hmm. with the, you know, med the medicine complex, the pharmaceutical. There's all kinds of ill drivers within that. But the idea that these folk genuinely live their lives in deliberate um, neglect or refusal to engage in all of those so-called systems of knowing and its benefits is the height of absurdity and they're hypocrites. Okay. The system, like the, you know, the indigenous knowledge in that. 
So I lived in an Inuit community for about five years and I saw it at mining conferences and I saw it at environmental conferences where they would say, okay, we have to look at the, his, you know, the indigenous people's knowledge. We have to look at the knowledge of the Inuit. They, which I can understand, like to speaking to the people about the history and, you know, speaking to some of the elders and they were like, okay, yeah, you know what, that glacier has moved back from when I was a child and, you know, okay. They might have a faulty memory of like the exact distance, but they can at least say, yes, if enough people say, okay, you know, that glacier has moved back since I was a child and you can say, okay, there's something going on that the glacier is shrinking, but you still need your core samples. You still need to go do all that stuff. And now we just had our new minister of the environment make this big, long speech. And this was just a day or two ago about how the first nations in Canada have been here for time immemorial, which I mean, that's wrong in and of itself. Um, and they, you know, they had whatever, a much better relationship with the land, this and that, and we have to rely on their knowledge of climate change. We cannot take on climate change with that, but it's like, yes, there is some, you know, there's the living memory of the people who are alive now, but beyond that, it's, it was an oral tradition. Like, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'll probably be a little bit more generous. I would say that, for, and certainly in Australia, where our first peoples have lived here for 50, 60,000 years at least, mm -hmm. although that time in memorial shtick happens every so often too, but leaving that aside <laughs> just a moment, there's obviously going to be a deep knowledge embedded into uh, stories, into uh, creative traditions, into a whole range of things, because first peoples lived very much in their land, and they have a they have a respect for that land and a way. So, it I'll be absolutely be open to the idea that there there may well be deep insights that we should certainly listen to, and we certainly shouldn't have the arrogance of thinking, oh, I'll wait till the scientist comes along, they'll tell you all about this species, this tree, this whatever. Obviously, there can be deep knowledge that's been wrought over many generations of people living so close in their environment and seeing it as part of their spiritual traditions. That's absolutely fine, though. No, no issue with that. The problem, I think, comes when there are fundamentally conflicting claims about the world around us, and you can't just say, because I come from this background, I'm going to say this thing is essentially a fact, and someone else is coming. So the time in memorial one's a great one. Well, either we all agree that there are there is time, and it passes, or we don't. If, if we're going to say, when you use the phrase time in memorial for your people, you're talking about a, a tradition, storytelling, an origin story, say. That's fine. Okay, well, we've got, we've got our origin stories too. The West, you know, Western Christian traditions and others had their origin stories too. Uh, do we need to revitalise them? And we'll, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves teaching, you know, creation of science in schools again. Because why on earth would you teach a Western science history of the universe it, the birth of the universe, the development of the solar system, the stars, etc. If we're not going to teach creation stories of the Western tradition as well, why would we privilege anything? Because at the end of the day, and again, it's this hypocrisy of it's like, are we all really living in different worlds? Really? You know, yeah. when we hop yeah. on a plane and travel around the world to go to a conference to talk about different ways of knowing, are we, are we really living in different worlds with different gravity systems? with different aerodynamics, yeah. with different computerized. Yeah, really? Is, is that what we're really doing? So sort of this, yeah. this oscillation between, let's say this is true, but the word true has become so mangled that it's really meaningless. Yeah. But this is important. And then there's also the truth, which is how we all get on a plane together and we all fly together using the navigation systems of that plane, thanks to Western science. Yeah, okay. Now, what you were talking about, with, you know, like First Nations or, you know, any Indigenous people. Yeah. Um, there is, like, that taught knowledge of, okay, this is, you know, when I was up north, if there was the caribou coming, okay, the caribou are coming, they're coming at this time, this is where they're going to be. So there is that passed down knowledge, and I'm not discounting anything like that. Like, even, okay, you know, you can make a tea from this that'll, you know, 
cure your headache or whatever, right? Like there, there is all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm not discounting any of that, but it was more of the talk of that there, that that intimate knowledge will help you fight climate change. And I'm like, okay, no, at, at, at a certain point, you can get some historical knowledge from those people, but you cannot rely on stories of myth and legend to tell you what the climate was like, you know, like, you know, since they've been there since time immemorial for whatever, like, you know, you can't go back thousands of years to say, okay, well, because of their stories, we know what the climate was like, you know, a thousand years ago or two, you know, whatever, 10,000 years ago. Like, that's what I was trying to get at. Like, I mean, and that's kind of what they're implying. Like, oh, they're the kept knowledge of the first nations will help us fight, fight climate change because, you know, they have the history of how the climate has changed. I'm like, no, they really don't. It's, it's not an oral tradition that was passed down like that. And that's, in some cases, that's what's being implied. Look, I think leaving aside whether there might be useful knowledge or not, and of course, useful knowledge has to be tested. <laughs> Who's going to do yeah. the testing? Leaving that aside, so rather than going down that rabbit hole, I think one of the reasons that's driving this is there's, um, if you like, a deep shame or distrust of, if you like, the industrial complex that has got us here which is the Western industrial complex and all the things that come around that. So therefore, there's this sort of, uh, I call it guilt of the elites that, okay, so maybe uh, fossil fuels have dragged millions of people out of poverty and developed the world in all these ways, but it's also ruining the planet. We need to go and listen to other people and what they will do. So I think irrespective of the, of the utility of what might emerge from these discussions, it's being driven by deep guilt about how things have run rampant with industrialization, et cetera, et cetera. And so I can understand that. All I'm saying is I'm, a, I'm absolutely open-minded about are there land management practices, as we might call them, are there various practices from First Peoples which helps us understand how we can have a sustainable way of um, engaging with the land around us or the environment. That's all fine. But at the end of the day, it's going to have to be tested to see if it works. And that's the real world that we all engage in. Yeah. Okay, no, I'll, I'll give you that. Like that's, you know, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, it was just like I said, I the, just what I saw in these meetings. That's what like just really shook me. I'm like, and it wasn't, it wasn't saying what you were just saying. It was like it was almost a key. It's it's a given that their knowledge is is equal to helping fix the problem. Yeah, as Western and look, science, and, and that, again, that's what. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I think one of the challenges is. And it's increasingly happening here, a little bit in Australia, more so in New Zealand, uh, but you might need to get a New Zealand guest on to talk more, is this idea of, let's call it uh, First Nations science, in inverted commas, and that it needs to be taught in universities. Uh, it's, if you like, the, the assumption is it's as legitimate as, let's call it Western science and enlightenment, et cetera. And that's a, that's a really complex one to untangle because... Uh, you know, a lot of bad things have happened in the name of science over the years. Um, science and a sort of naive scientism may well have been blind to some things. That's certainly the case. But the challenge will be it's very hard to have a whole lot of belief systems that make claims about the universe or the world around us and somehow give them equal footing without having to leave your critical faculties outside your brain. So, you know, there'll be, there are origin stories about the universe as it's understood, for instance, by Indigenous peoples around the world. They could be beautiful, deeply engaging. They could be insightful about culture and all the rest of it. But we've also got something called the Hubble telescope. Now, if you're going to say Western science's understanding of the universe is no more or less better or worse than any other society's understanding of the universe dating back since time immemorial, then I suppose the question is, uh, so what do we do with the Hubble telescope? Choose not to look at it. And the remarkable insights that I would have thought are some of the most deeply profound insights, and they've only been wrought through the expertise and the capability of Western science. So what happens when you've got uh, deep insights into the origins of the universe brought about by something like the Hubble telescope and all the scientists working with it, are we saying that that needs to be reconciled with or held alongside with an origin story from somewhere else as if they're in some way equally true? 
So the word true is getting so mangled that it is to be ridiculous. Um, is it just, you know, is the insight about the origins of the universe garnered through science and devices like the Hubble telescope and radio telescopes, is that just another way of knowing the universe? Are we seriously saying that? And that's, I think that's where it gets difficult. And, <laughs> it's, it, and that's what's coming into universities increasingly. And it's going to be really interesting for students as they come through, um, how are they going to respond to or how they're going to challenge the idea that there can be different systems of knowledge that somehow have to be given equality or equity probably is the better word. Yeah. Okay. On that. Um, so like all this stuff, like, I don't know, the social justice stuff, woke, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, critical race theory started off from critical legal scholarship in the States. And it's, I mean, it's, I mean, critical legal scholarship was a critique of the legal system and it was looking at jurisprudence and it started out in law schools and critical race theory is still taught in law schools. Like you can take it in law classes and stuff And it. Um, so it's a very American centric, but, and I mean, post-colonialism, I mean, whatever Edward said, like with Orientalism and all that, I mean, yes, it's an American thing as well, but it, really took root in Europe and Canada. That's how we did a lot of our multiculturalism. I don't know about Australia, but I look at some of the spread of this stuff. And I mean, I can, I hear about, I've heard stuff from like European scholars and I, you know, you can see it in the UK. I see it in Canada, how like this American, like this stuff that was purely based on the American legal system is coming into Canada and it's, we're making policy on it. Like we've got it to, we've, we basically got a ministry of CRT in all but name. Um, but I see what it does to um, developing countries. So uh, it's the gender stuff is having a huge impact on women's rights in India. Um, a lot of the post-colonial stuff and some of the anti-racism stuff in like the MENA region, uh, when people try to bring in like secularism and free speech and things like that, they just say, okay, that they are actually using the thing of that's another form of colonialism. But I saw this one thing in 2016 and it was from the university of Johannesburg. I believe it was in South Africa. And it was a conference that said science must fall. And it was the science department and the philosophy department from that university having like a two hour long meeting and someone from the philosophy department got up and said, like, this is Western European science. We don't need it. We can have our sh shaman that can call lightning down on people. And one of the people in the science department snickered and was made to apologize. And I see this stuff spreading out from the United States. And like, whatever, if it gets into Western universities, I think that's bad on its own. But when you're when you're exporting this to countries that are developing or you know that don't have like an enlightenment tradition, you're sending them on like even worse path to fail. And I mean, like I'm like, and you, I mean, they talk about post-colonialism or decolonization, but I'm like, you're colonizing these people all over again with a very Western view. You know, that's like the enlightenment. You can trace that thought back you know, to the golden age of Islam, you can trace some of the stuff back to like Egypt even. But this I, stuff I, is... I think you've, you've hit on something really interesting there, that this is really a second colonization of the elites. Absolutely. I think we can be that, that, we can be that aggressive in characterizing that way. That the stuff that's now coming out of our learned institutions in, in certain areas and is increasingly creeping everywhere and making its way into developing countries, etc., is a really radioactive second colonization, especially for people who haven't wrought the benefits of the emancipation that science can bring and the benefits that science can bring. So, and it comes from people who are living in their cozy lifestyles, driving their electric cars around, flying in planes, have the benefits of modern medicine. Half of them wouldn't be here without the benefits of modern medicine. And they're going lecturing people about how science needs to be decolonized. Now, there's always a slither of something legitimate about that. You know, science, like any other 
complex system of endeavour will be shaped by and biased by, towards, a whole lot of people that are involved in it and benefit from it. But that's true, I'd say, for almost any any endeavour. And in fact, I'd say that's true for the endeavour of progressive academics who are now making a living out of this shtick. They're a perfect example of exactly what they claim everybody else is doing. They're peddling a system of knowledge that benefits their own careers, their own journal articles, their own students and their own funding. So as a result, in the paper that I've written, basically the claim is Islamophobia is everywhere. Give us more funding to, to critique Islamophobia and battle it. You know, so in other words, you know, so there's something to that sort of postmodern cynical approach to when you see people saying, you must believe this, we must do more of this. It's benefiting them and their cohort. That's absolutely true. You know, that is the human condition of, of so many of these things. But to reduce it merely to that is the problem. And again, I'd say to these people who say, let's decolonize science. If they're simply meaning we need more people of color in the labs, great. Absolutely. Let's do that. But if they're saying the outcomes and what we see in science today, say in medicine, for example, are compromised because they are made by white cis people or whatever, well, then go and stop using it. Stop using modern medicine. Don't have your vaccination. Go and do something else instead. So in other words, there's a slim element of truth and insight into how systems can work in favour of those peddling it across all. But then there's a complete hypocrisy from many of these people that they'll go to an international conference, stay in an air-conditioned hotel, use a laser pointer to point out something like, you know, science doesn't exist, and yet they're using a laser pointer to underline the words. I mean, what the hell? You know, they're, they're, they're living, they epitomise the contradictions of themselves, and yet you get a whole lot of people nodding their heads saying, oh, that's so true, science is just another construction of the world. And yet they're using, a, how does that laser pointer work again? Expl explain... Explain the, you know, first people's knowledge of a laser pointer. How does a laser work? No, that's, that's the hypocrisy yeah. of it. But, <clears throat> okay, there, there's worse than that right now, though. I mean, so there were, uh, I'll give you th uh, three examples. So there was <clears throat> the CDC in the United States in January, or was, was January is just before Christmas. Um it was the guideline had come out, it got printed in the New York times and then they retracted the guideline the next day. But they were saying that, you know, they, they literally said that we're, we don't, we'd rather give it to people of color than instead of the, uh, the elderly, because the elderly are mostly white. They've had a privileged life. And this was a recommendation to this or from the CDC. And that, that's under the, the auspices of health equity. There was another case where uh, there was a, Pakistani doctor, they were giving out the vaccine. He had, they'd opened one up and the clinic was closing. He had to get rid of the vaccine. What was left of the bottle, there was something like 10 doses left. Otherwise it would go bad. So instead of letting it go bad, he went around to his neighborhood, gave it to his neighbors. And the last dose he gave to his mother who was like in her eighties. Okay. So he got fired because they said he was giving it to too many South Asians. And this guy was Pakistani. He was giving it to all to Indians, except for his mother. Mm. What a <laughs> white thing to do. That's just white supremacy yeah, manifest. No, but, but yeah, yeah. But in, in Ontario, well, in, yeah, in Canada, in Ontario, they had like, well, I can't remember what city it was, um, but they were doing that. They were, they were prioritizing people for the vaccine by their skin color. And I mean, so that's another aspect of this decolonization stuff. Like you have to make it equitable and sorry, like one last thing on this, like they'll, they'll take statistics. So um, three times as many, uh, you know, black children are, will die in childbirth as white children. And yeah, that's technically true, but it's, Something like 99.008 for white children and 99.00, uh, 99.025 for black children. Okay, so it's, yes, it is three times as much, but that, like, that little sliver, like, you know, like, like what you're talking about, it, the, like, the, the survival rate's still, like, you know, like 99% or something like that. It, it, so, 
they're looking for, like you said, yeah, they're, they're saying, okay, there's so much of it. It's all hidden. We're going to go find it for you. Give us money so we can go find it. And this is what they find. But so like that decolonization stuff, I don't know how far it's gotten in Australia, but like I said, we've got it in policy in Canada. Oh, we're, it's, coming, it's coming here increasingly. So yeah, probably yeah. held off a little bit because we've got a conservative national government at the moment, federal mm. government. And I don't think they're huge fans of this kind of thing, but they're certainly coming and certainly coming through the institutions. Uh, and mm. they're certainly, you'll find the phrase decolonize. Uh, and you know, Australia has a sorry history of colonization, of course, mistreatment of indigenous mm. peoples was, was appalling. And, and in many ways it still manifests. But when people say decolonize, um, you need to really ask them, so what, what precisely do you mean? Does decolonize mean remove all of the insights of medical health care from the way that we try to bring health care to Indigenous people? Because all of those outcomes of medical interventions that have come mm -hmm. through Western science, if you're going to call them colonizing, well, let's not give the vaccine to Indigenous people then, because how can, not that, how can that not be a manifestation of colonization because it's come from science? So, again, it's, it's like the Mott and Bailey argument. You know, I think James Lindsay and others talk about it. Do you really mean what you're saying? Or do you really mean this particular thing? And we might even be able to agree on some of this particular thing. But they're not claiming that particular thing. They're claiming this. We need to decolonise science. And all I'm saying is, well, that's patently hypocritical because you can see the vast majority of these people are living with the benefits of modern science. And they're certainly not rejecting all that. They're talking about something else, and but they're not talking openly about something else. And they're also looking for the, as I talk about in my paper, there's this sort of obsession around finding evidence of hidden systems of oppression in any little data point, no matter how small that data point may be, or indeed how dubious that data point may be. And that's why I talk about this, these attitudinal surveys are used as hard evidence, dare I use it, scientific evidence yeah. of racism, and so there's this, and I call it the, these asymmetries between we jump between when it's convenient to use something and when it's not, but we're actually using the same thing. But it's the it's the moral righteousness of those that are making the allegations against those who aren't. Yeah. So, like, how far has it gone? Like, I mean, here you had the Harvard School of Medicine putting out a paper on why two plus two equals five. Right. Like, you know, that, that's scary. Um, you've had physics departments from, I want to say Cornell, but like from big universities put out papers about how physics is racist and, you know, studying light is right. Like, like these are from physics departments. Like this is not a humanities, you know, like a, a student in the arts writing a paper about, about this. This is, you know, coming out of these departments. I, I don't want to give up, but you know, um, I think you'd mentioned him uh, when we were uh, talking before, like going back and forth it was with the, in the emails, uh, you'd mentioned Lee Jessup and like leads us like, yeah, he's like, I, I think the Academy's lost. And in the U S and Canada, it's, it's, it's just awful. I mean, we had a Middle Eastern woman get f fired from a university because in her blog post, like she, so she'd come to Canada from the Middle East. She was teaching at a university in the Maritimes and she put wrote in her blog post that she didn't think Canada was a systemically racist place. And she, you know, basically putting praise on Canada. She got fired. Um, it, it's, it's ridiculous here. So like, how bad is it in Australia? Like, are, are you, are you as far gone as, you know, the United States and Canada? I mean, like the UK is coming up a little bit behind us as well. Look, I think we're on the way. Um, it, you know, th this is the religious cult like element to this sort of uh, critical theory stuff is that by even asking the question or, daring to def, uh, to dis dispute, you then become proof of the very thing your opponents are calling you. So, uh, you know, an immigrant coming to Canada saying they think that Canada's not systemically racist is somehow <laughs> evidence of racism. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the cult-like element to this, which is the fact that it's happening within universities is an abomination. Because, you know, the universities need to be the one place where intellectual critique can really hit home. And we see this ridiculous theatre going on within our academic institutions where um, you've, got to, uh, you've got to defer towards all of these 
completely overblown statements about, you know, uh, the nature of science, the nature of democracy, the nature of the Western Enlightenment, etc. And if you even want to point out something more nuanced or sophisticated than that, you just become evidence of being racist, being a colonizer, etc. And that's that's not intellectual debate. That's that's a cult. And as I, I've said recently to an, in another interview, universities are rapidly becoming what the Catholic Church was to Galileo rather than the other way around. Universities are now becoming the, the places that delineate uh, who should be brought into the fold and who should be cast out. They're providing the tools for the mobs outside the institution and sometimes within the institution to start howling and, you know, uh, telling people they need to leave. And it's a very, very concerning trend. And it's happening, it's happening across the certainly developed world, if I can use that term. Um, and it's very concerning. Something you mentioned before about the Enlightenment, how, you know, it's self-correcting. It looks in on itself. But when you, you know, like what's going on in the universities, what's going on in ac academia in like Enlightenment liberal secular democracies, right? And they're getting less and less liberal by the day, but we're the only ones in the world who will look back and say, you know what? Yeah, we did this, 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 and this, this was bad. We're, let's not do it again. Yeah. Like you will not have China looking back on their sins. Like as they are right now, you know, you don't have Saudi Arabia looking back at its, its misdeeds and you don't, you know, uh, Erdogan is not talking about, you know, the colonization by the Ottoman empire. Like you don't have any of that. Like we're the only people. And so do you think that some of this stuff in the Academy was taking advantage of that? I mean, like, like the postmodern stuff, the coast, you know, the critical theory, like not even so much Marx, like Marx's stuff, because Marx didn't like the enlightenment, but like he, like this stuff goes even further than like, you know, like what Marx's critiques of the enlightenment, like, but like, do you like, do you see this taking advantage of it? Or do you just see that that was a weakness in academia where they let too much go? A really interesting question. And I think it's a study. It's, I wrote another paper a year ago, um, looking at a, a Darwinian approach to postmodern critical theory. Yeah. And one of the, one of the mm -hmm. points in that paper was, trying to understand the drivers of this, because it seems so inherently ridiculous that the critical self-reflection that is the hallmark of a lot of the intellectual liberal tradition has now become so toxic that it's eating itself and it's actually diminishing the very thing that is was always the strength, which is that ability to critique, the ability to, have, to look at evidence, the ability to test and the ability to have debate without fear of being cast out. Now, that might be rather an idealised characterisation of it. And that's absolutely not the case now in the academy. There's this openly expressed self-loathing towards uh, the Western Enlightenment, as if it's the thing to do, from people coming from uh, who have benefited from that very thing themselves. I think it's become an industry. You know, it's like the Southern Poverty Law Centre. There seems to be more hate now than there ever was, even when the Ku Klux Klan were at their peak. And that, and that episode with Marjorie Nawaz is so is exemplary of the shtick of some of these places. They have to find more and more of the thing they say is, is evil in order to justify their existence and to build up their programs and to build up their little empires. But I think the trouble is they can be allowed to do that to an extent as long as the rest of the world's ignoring them and insulated from them. But even in the last five to ten years, this stuff's now becoming mainstream. As you say, it's finding its way into places where you know, this stuff about... Um, you know, sort of strong social constructivism and relativism and critical race. This has been around for ages in the academy, but in, in departments and areas where nobody gave us stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm from the humanities myself, the arts and humanities. I remember sitting in the 90s uh, in postgraduate seminars with people talking about our all knowledge is a social construction. And, you know, that was just, <laughs> I thought, well, no one's going to take this seriously because that's so patently absurd if you really mean it. Um, not if you don't really mean, if you simply mean knowledge is shaped by and influenced by these range of things, no one reasonable would deny that. But if you're going to say all knowledge is a social construction and no knowledge is more privileged than any other knowledge, well, you're living proof that that's clearly not true. But I'd never have assumed 20 years ago 
that it would now be mainstream. And I think that's where the problems become. It, it has grown like a virus out of control for the benefit of those peddling it. And now with the, and this is where I think John Height's got some insight, with, if you overlay that with social media, where you can get, you know, 10,000 angry anonymous people to call for the dismissal of an academic that said something, those two things have created a toxic combination of, of an industry complex now about the people that are peddling this stuff and how it serves their own agendas. And I think that's really worthy of examination. Yeah, I mean, I think also, like, so when I look at the timeline of the scholarship and how it's how it started going, and you know, obviously, like, this is just me, some schmuck on Twitter who likes to read, um, and it was so like around the early '90s was I think where when you can really start getting. We had like he had a conference in '89 that kind of codified critical race theory. Then Kimberly Crenshaw started writing about um, intersectionality around that same time. But it was around the early '90s where it, that was being brought into the courses, so into the sociology courses, into the, like you know, into some law departments and in, into all. And so the people who were getting out with PhDs were coming out, you know, post '96, '97, around that time. And then, at least in the United States and Canada, a lot of these people are, I mean, they're not fit for purpose for much, but they're going into, like, they're going to HR, they're going into the administration. These are the people like, oh, I've got a PhD in sociology and I, you know, I did it in like African-American studies or whatever. So, okay, you're an expert on race, so we'll hire you for anti-racism or whatever. Like, so it was that long march through the institutions where they were just, I mean, they come in, okay, we need more diversity officers. I mean, the, their whole goal, they come in with the, they presuppose that racism exists or sexism exists or homo, you know, whatever, whatever they're focusing on that exists. We just have to go find it. I mean, it's. Yeah. You know, and if it's not obvious, we need to look harder and get more funding to do the research yeah. to find it. Yeah. Exactly. And then, or we need to hire more people and then, I think I was. I think that's part of the problem with academia was they became so siloed off, and they gave like so the departments were siloed off from each other. The credential of the PhD became, and I'm like, I don't want to take anything away. Like you know, I have a lot of respect for someone who can go through and you know, like uh, Brian Green or Lawrence Crowther, like yeah, you know, like people who've done PhDs and. I'm not talking about some of the stuff I've read off like near real or near real peer review and things like that, but I mean like legitimate papers and things and like, but that got so much respect that, okay. A physicist would not have listened to a a sociology, you know, a sociology, like someone with a PhD in sociology saying physics is racist. Like they would, that wouldn't have happened. But now, because they've got a PhD in whatever, why, some why race, physics is racist, yes, and, and, yeah, or no, but or or a you know, like critical race theory has been given such a it's got a pedigree now. Like, there, I think University of Chicago was open to school of critical race theory. Um, so they well, that person studies race and they've got a doctorate in it, they must know, mm. but they don't know the methodology or. or you know, that they're using, they don't know anything behind it. So then a physics, you know, the physics department might then listen to them, especially if it's coming from the administration and this person's got a PhD in whatever, and, you know, in anti-racism or whatever. Like, I, I don't even know what the PhDs in these things are called, but so I think that's, that's therein lies one of the problems with the, the academy. It, 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 it didn't, they didn't pay enough attention to what everyone else was doing. Like there was no vetting of anything that was going on. Cause I, like I read some of these papers and I'm like, who the hell wrote this and who the hell like thought this was a good idea to publish. I mean, you'd mentioned James Lindsay, like the thing him, Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose did the grievance studies affair. I mean, like none of those papers should have been published. Yeah. But they're like the liquid man in Terminator. The thing, the thing about critical race theory and this, all that postmodern shtick is, no matter how much you critique it, it just reforms and they're able to say, because of this is the religious nature of it, 
look at the people attacking us, they're attacking us because we're right. And no matter, you know, there's been devastating intellectual critiques of all of this stuff for years now, you know, going back to Alan Sokol around that time and since, you know, since the 90s onwards. And uh, Pluck Gross and uh, Bogosian and Lindsay's work is just a, another manifestation, another attempt. Now, you could take that to mean there must be something really true about these intellectual ideas. That's one theory. And then the other theory, which I address, you know, I look at in my the other paper I mentioned, is that there's something really going on in the political economy of this stuff that makes it almost immune from intellectual critique, despite the patent intellectual self-contradictions in much of it. And it's become, it's become an industry. It's become exactly what they claim everybody else is, a self-fulfilling, self-supporting industry that denounces anyone that, don't, that challenges it or don't believe in it. And it's become exactly the thing they say they detest everywhere else. You know, the modern industrial complex, uh, modern medicine, big pharma, colonization, all those things. You know, and that's, that's the slither of truth in that insight, in that systems become self-perpetuating and they find intellectual ways of, of denouncing those that don't agree with them. You know, that's a very useful insight. The problem is, unless you can agree on a shared understanding of what constitutes knowledge, how do we test knowledge, how do we use evidence, etc., it's basically turned them into a cult. And th the most disappointing thing is the cult's taking over our intellectual institutions because people are scared to stand up. No one wants to be called racist. No one wants to be called Islamophobic. No one, you know, X, Y, Z phobic. Who wants to be called that? Particularly when you get 10,000 people on social media demanding your resignation because... Uh, you said something about the nature of biological reality. So I think that's a real problem. And institutions, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree with Lee when he says, you know, the institutions are, are possibly past a point of no return. Now, what will happen is alternatives will shoot up, as we've seen. There'll be, you know, a, let's make university 2.0. The risk is, of course, they'll speak to the people who already know there's something wrong. But the vast majority of the other institutions are still churning students through. And you've got to ask the question, are they really preparing these kids to have uh, the intellectual and moral courage to challenge what they're being taught? We're putting up your hand and say, saying, actually, I've read Kimberly Crenshaw and I don't quite agree with her. And you'll just get told, well, that's because you're, you know, you're an XYZ and you would say that. That's going to be hugely problematic. Like I saw the the University of uh, what Austin, like the like the, they just announced that. Okay. Yeah, okay, I'm all for that. There was also another liberal arts university. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but is it Ralston College? I'm thinking of. It's it's an online. Yeah, maybe I think it's it could be that one where they say you know we want to go back to that classical approach and we're going to do. I think that all that's great, but I agree with you. Like it is a war of attrition because I mean, again, I don't. It's, it's I think it's much farther along here than it is uh, other parts of the world. It's in K through 12 education now, right? And so the, the colleges of education have been taken over. So the teachers that are, that are churning out think this way. Not all, you know, like I've spoken to teachers who are trying to push back against it and, you know, who are, and they're telling me like what they, when they went through the colleges of education, what they learned and how they were being taught and the framework they were being told to use. So unless you fix that and like, here's where it gets tricky. Like I'm, I look at the K through 12 education. I look at it like, you know, like you're talking about, inter you know, uh, intelligent design, things like that. This stuff is religion. I don't want it forming curriculum, but you know, if you have seniors in high school, like, you know, the people in like the last couple of years of high school, if you're doing like a comparative philosophy or comparative sociology or something like that, you want to talk about critical race theory and, you know, compare Derek Bell to Thomas Sowell. I, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Yep, agree. You know, and in the university, I, I don't want to uh, ban it, but it has to be the standard. Like someone should vet, like, you know, you're giving this person a PhD. Do they meet the standards that the university has set out? Like, you know, the university should set out, like we, you know, we're going to judge things based on this criteria. And if you can't meet that criteria, then, you know, we can't accreditate you or something like that. If someone wants to waste their time on 
you know, dissecting Ibram Kendi, go ahead. Like, you know, like fill your boots, but their work has to be vetted. And that's extremely problematic because I agree with you, but I don't see how it's going to happen <clears throat> because the whole idea of vetting implies that there is a sort of stable base of criteria from which you can do that vetting. And of course, that's the very thing that's being challenged. The end result is that if you're doing a thesis in the right kind of area, say a social justice area, you've got your set canonical texts, which is deeply ironic considering the attack from uh, the postmodernists on the canon. So you've got your canonical texts, you quote them religiously, you don't engage in any debate or dispute of the supposed insights of those canonical thinkers. So you see how religious this is. And then you just go and apply it to a thing you come out with the determination that everybody else is racist or whatever it happens to be, and you get your PhD because you've successfully applied, I think Frederick Cruz called it years ago, the literary critic, you've you successfully applied the thematic stencil. So it's got the outcome you're always going to get. And yes, people get PhDs doing that kind of stuff nowadays. Now, they have done for quite a while, but I think for many years nobody cared because it didn't impact a multitude of other disciplines like, in, if you like, very generally in the sciences. But now it is. So what's happened is I think many people in academia who have been concerned about this, but it hasn't directly affected their disciplines, it's been a little bit outside it, they've been asleep at the wheel or just naively thinking, this is crazy stuff. It's never going to, gener it's never going to go outside of the confines of the gender studies department or whatever. Well, no, it's everywhere now. And so the question is, how can one challenge it, legitimately challenge it, without falling into all of the traps that get thrown against you, if, should you do? This is in bad faith. You're just proof of it. You're being, you're being triggered by it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, notice that only ever goes in one direction. And then the other thing is, how, not only how does one do that, but how does one really try to unpack what is the political economy of this stuff that has made it flourish? Because it's certainly not its intellectual integrity, which is highly dubious. You don't need a, you don't need a PhD in philosophy to see some of this stuff is manifestly self-contradictory. But the problem is people have been critiquing the intellectual flaws in this kind of approach for years, quite legitimately and quite well, going back 20, 30 beyond years, and it hasn't changed it. Because what people haven't been looking at is what is the economy of this? What are the drivers of this? And there's a whole lot of drivers of this from both within the academy, outside the academy, the need for people in the humanities and the more sort of fear, you know, the old people that would have spent their entire lifetime studying Shakespeare, writing massive monographs on one tiny scene from a Shakespeare play, pretty much irrelevant for 99.99% of the rest of the, of, the, of the population. But now people from the arts and social sciences can be at the forefront of global social change because they apply a whole lot of these dodgy theories to their work as if they're insights. So you can see how people from the humanities, arts and social sciences sector within academia are loving this. This is like their wet dream because they're now at the forefront of global change. Whereas years and years ago, they were doing these tiny slivers of research into old texts or some piece of art or whatever, and nobody gave us stuff. So they're loving this. But one of the things about this, like going back to the decolonization, I don't hear from any of the departments. I, I, I granted, I, you know, I, it's not like I'm scouring the internet or anything like that for it, but I don't, okay, fine. You want to decolonize the, the curriculum or the canon, but instead of getting rid of knowledge, like, you know, there's a stoic tradition in India that goes back 2000 years. Like, why don't you go research? Like, why doesn't someone go research that? You know, I, I'd read an article about this guy named Jakob who apparently he fell afoul of a king in Ethiopia and he, because he made fun of Catholicism, then he went out and hid in a cave for a couple of years. And, you know, I think it was like a century before Kant um, and, and, or sorry, Locke and Hume, he came up with ideas very similar to Locke and Hume, but he was just sitting and thinking by himself in a cave. So, you know, you figure he'd come out with more like Walden or something, but anyways, but yeah, he came out with the same kind of thought. So wouldn't it behoove these people who want to decolonize the curriculum or the canon or whatever to actually go find this work by, you know, non-white thinkers? I mean, I, 
I wouldn't mind reading some of this. Like, you know, like, you know, granted I'm not in school or whatever, and I'm not going to spend as much time as someone who's studying it, but some of it would probably be interesting, but like, you know, like, is anyone doing anything like that? Or is anyone even trying to, or is it just all criticizing the West? A good question, because I don't think there's a really strong urge amongst these folk to find counterexamples unless they can then be categorized as acting white. So the example you're given might be rather problematic. And, and that's the thing, you know, you don't need that many counterexamples to come along before you start asking the question, you know, this looks like bullshit to me. But I don't think there's much energy directed that way. There's a lot of energy directed at about finding white supremacy mm -hmm. manifest in every element of science and mathematics, rather than actually trying to really critique the idea of of you know, the whiteness of mathematics or the the colonization within sciences there's not a whole lot of effort of looking for counter examples for that which of course there wouldn't be why because that's the scientific method isn't it you know what how do you test the idea that you have how do you look for counter examples that's why they hate popper Karl popper of course because the obvious thing to ask is okay you've got all the ideas under what circumstances could you show me that these ideas could be proved wrong well they can't and in fact, getting critiqued proves them to be even more right. So you can see why they love it. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges is it's self-serving to say science, Western science is a construction for its own purpose because it's really only Western science, logic, evidence, et cetera, that is really the threat to their belief systems. So they need to be able to deny its validity. And they do so by basically making all these claims about uh, the nature of, the, of, of Western science itself, because that's... You know, those, those key tools of empiricism, evidence, argument, testing, falsification, they're all the things that are highly contagious to postmodern critical theory. So they need to find their own ways of denying its existence or denying its validity. Yeah, stick your head in the sand. Um, look, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer, but I know you started something, um, I don't know if it's a podcast or a series of interviews called Permission to Think with Josh Zepps. You wouldn't mind talking a bit about that. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that. So, look, uh, we've, we've started soon. So, Josh Steps is a well-known uh, Australian mm -hmm. media figure here, but he was in the States for many years. And he runs a fantastic podcast already called Uncomfortable Conversations. I'd mm -hmm. urge your listeners to have a look at it. Terrific podcast. But he's also an alumni of our, our university here. So, he studied in the very faculty that I'm, I'm the dean of uh, a few years ago. And so, I had a chat to him. Uh, I'm very keen to provide a platform for really critically minded, academically minded, evidence driven people to come in and show that there are other ways of addressing and having nuanced conversations about some really tricky things. So we've got Peter Boghossian on first, he was our first guest. We've got Ella Manea on as the second, who's talking about Islam and women. She's in a position too. And we've got a whole range of speakers coming in who are basically going to provide a very scholarly and evidence-based approach to things which many of us would think, well, that's so radioactive, I don't want to even go near it. And this is really just to open up the door because the, the greatest threat that uh, sort of this suite of critical theory approaches is it's not only going to censor what you say, it's going to tell you you can't even think these things, even allowing yourself to think so what is the evidence for that? Well, that argument looked wrong to me. Even allowing yourself to think that will soon be a thought crime if we're not careful. Yeah. And so the reason the series is called Permission to Think is it's providing people who have legitimate lived experience, so not middle-aged white guys coming in talking about things that you know they've never experienced it. These are people um, who have legitimacy within, if you like, the community or the communities they're talking about. But in addition to that legitimacy as individuals, they've got academic and scholarly legitimacy. Just to open up the veil uh, for other people to say, okay, well, they've raised a whole lot of interesting critiques and questions around this thing. And they're a person of colour or they're Muslim or they're gay. So maybe I can as well. And I'm not a white supremacist. Maybe I can as well. And that's really the point of the series. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, you know, Peter's oh, like Peter's fantastic, but uh, like I've spoken with uh, Elon before, and uh, you know I've I've actually met her a couple of times. Um, yeah, I know Elon's awesome. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to read her book. Unfortunately, I think it only come out in German, but uh, 
she sent me a copy of it in English. It was. Um, the, it's the perils of nonviolent Islamism, I think, or nonviolent Islam. That's one of them. Yeah, yeah. She talks about her work and talks about her work mm -hmm. in her interview with Josh. Yeah, no, like uh, she's great. But, well, anyways, thank you very much. It was great talking to you. Um, I don't know if you have any last words. Uh -huh. I did. If you have any, la no. Thanks for having me on. It's great, but I've, I've been following you for following you for at least a couple of years, and and really admire the work you're doing and the guests that you have on. So I'd never have thought I'd be on it myself. So I'm a, I'm a fan of your fan of your work, Abed. Well, thank you very much, Alan, and uh, thanks everyone for listening.